All right, my next question is from Wendy, and um, she asks, I'm currently reading a Bible study through the book of Daniel, and I've been searching for some historical background on this question to no avail. Do you know any historical background about where Daniel was during the time chapter 3 takes place? Uh, thanks, she says. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Daniel's nowhere to be seen. And, and most likely what was happening was, uh, he was in a government role, and so he'd probably been called out of town uh, on some mission or, or, or something uh, like that for the government. Government, But um, as you mentioned, uh, his absence in chapter 3 is, is total, totally significant uh, in the passage. And so you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're being commanded to worship this image that Nebuchadnezzar comes up with, and Daniel's nowhere to be seen. And so um, he's obviously still in the kingdom. Uh, he apparently just isn't um, in town at that point, uh, at the place where uh, Nebuchadnezzar had set up the, the image. The thing that is significant about that is that whole chapter is a type. It's a type of the Antichrist. It's a type of the image of the beast. Uh, it's also a type of the persecution of Jewish believers during the tribulation period. And it's a type of the missing church too. Daniel being representative of the fact that there is a group of believers um, who uh, literally uh, have no fault before God. When you, when you read the book of Daniel, one of the things that's notable about the book itself is that Daniel, there's never anything mentioned about Daniel that's negative. And uh, he's one of the few guys in the Old Testament that that's the case with him. And obviously Daniel's a sinner. Um, you see him in, in uh, chapter nine confessing his sin and the sin of his people Israel. And so it's not that Daniel was a perfect man, but you don't ever hear him uh, being um, condemned by God or being found guilty by God. And that's a situation that we're in as a church. Even though we're all, we're all sinners and we know about our guilt, uh, we stand righteous before God because of what Jesus has done for us. And when the time comes for the tribulation uh, period, one of the things that gonna, that's gonna be notable about the true church of God is that it's missing in the story. And you see this again when you're going through the book of Revelation. It's church, 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 all the way through Revelation uh, chapter one through three, and then from four all the way to the, the very last chapter uh, in the book of Revelation, the church isn't mentioned again. Uh, again, until the term church is not mentioned until you get to the last chapter. The only time that you see the church is as the wife of the lamb and the church is in heaven in Revelation chapter 19. Um, also, arguably, you could be talking about the 24 elders being representative of the church in Revelation 4 and 5. And so uh, um, I believe that the reason that Daniel is missing in that story is because Daniel's a type of the church. The, uh, the, three, um, the three friends of Daniel, uh, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah, uh, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, are representative of the Jews going through the fire. And then again, you see um, somebody like, this, like a son of God um, standing with them as they're going through the fire. By the way, the um, image that is raised uh, is, an, is most likely an image of Nebuchadnezzar that comes from the previous chapter. He had been told that he was the head of gold, that Babylon was the first kingdom and that Babylon was gonna be succeeded, succeeded by a number of other kingdoms. And what uh, Nebuchadnezzar was saying is, no, I'm not. And it's gonna be one image and it's all of gold and it's gonna last forever. And that image was 66 cubits tall, it says, and it was worshiped with six manner of musical instruments. And so you have in the passage uh, 66 and six, which obviously um, recalls uh, the number of the beast when you get to the New Testament. So in that passage, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist uh, persecuting the Jews. So. Is there a commentary that you know of that talks about that? Uh, probably, you know, my favorite commentary on Daniel is by John Walvoord. Yeah, and, I looked in there and he didn't comment on that. Oh, uh, okay, so it, um, in, in that instance, um, it's probably gonna be Gabalin. 
uh, G A E uh, B E L I N. Uh, there's there's a num number number of other guys um, that that you could look at. There's a good chance that Ironside uh, would have that in there. Okay. Otherwise, you could just attribute it to me. Yeah. I I'm the first know. one who ever said that, you guys. <laughs> no, I, I got it from somebody else. Did that off the cuff. But anyway, what what you just said, that little subtlety where you're pulling out a type that is significant enough to correlate with the New Testament church plan, there's no way you're going to convince me that some dude in the Old Testament writing his story about a historical record of what he's doing in Babylon throws in there something that is significant to the flow of the story of the Bible yeah, of the church amazing. in biblical revelation. Yeah. It's those little, and they're everywhere. Yeah, From everywhere. Genesis to Revelation, from the plan of God, the person that's there is significant, their name is significant, the fact who's not there is significant, and all... The fact that they're not mentioned is significant. Yeah, yeah. and it all filters yeah. into the story. There's, it's one of the biggest proofs to me that the Holy Spirit is the author. Because yep. you have 66 books by 70 guys or over that all of a sudden communicate in a way that it all just fits together. That's yep. impossible. Right. It's amazing. Yep. So good question, Wendy. Thanks for sending that in.